Working Class Audio is made possible by the support of Audio Technica, Gearspace.com, The License Lab, and Sampley Audio. This is the Working Class Audio Podcast, Session 368. Working Class Audio. Navigating the world of recording with a working class perspective. Here's your host, Matt Boudreaux. Thanks, Chuck. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Working Class Audio Podcast. This is session 368 you're listening to. My guest today is mixing engineer and audio educator Wavy Wayne, who's worked with artists such as Jim Jones, Future, Ashanti, Yogati, Dave East, and many, many more. Wayne is somebody who I discovered on Instagram, of all places, because I started following his videos and reels that he was putting out there that I found informative, educational, and uh, highly entertaining. So I started to do a little more research on him, and I found that he was somebody that I wanted to know a lot more about. Very excited to have him on, Wavy Wayne, coming up here on the Working Class Audio Podcast. Grab your coffee cups, friends. Let's talk about clearing the clutter for the next year. Well, you've probably heard it time and time again, if you listen to the podcast for a decent amount of time, you probably heard me complain about how the studio is dirty and how I'm organizing. And let's face it, I am no saint when it comes to that. And it's always a work in progress, always trying to do better, keep things clean. As most people are making, you know, New Year's resolutions, I'm going to make a New Year's habit instead. And that habit is to maintain a clutter free environment. This is not just applicable to my studio. This is applicable to the rest of the house where, of course, my studio resides. So what I've done is I've actually figured out that I can't just clean the studio. I actually have to clean the areas that lead up to the studio. That starts with, of all places, the bathroom, right? So I have a drawer. It's filled with stuff like old toothpaste tubes that I haven't thrown out because, you know, there's like a little bit of toothpaste left, right? And we all know that we want that last bit of toothpaste, which is completely ridiculous. Long story short, I've cleaned out the bathroom. I've got rid of all the clutter and excess that is not being used. That extends, of course, then to my bedside table getting rid of books that I've read or books I'm never going to read, you know, giving them, donating them to the local library. So it was great to clean that whole thing out and get it, get it organized. When you come into my house, there is a um, a kind of a bureau, kind of a walnut bureau where each of us in the family has a drawer. We call it our cubbies. I know dating back to when the kids were young. So I have a cubby drawer that was filled with unopened bills that or paid online that I didn't go through, filled with old birthday cards, gift cards, all kinds of crazy stuff. So I had to go through there and I had to clean all that. Finally, it leads into the studio because if those areas for me are clean, then the studio is the next on the list and that can really help me organize even further because there are things that accumulate in the studio that don't belong in the studio that might belong somewhere in the house. And, you know, the key is, is making sure everything has its place. You know, whether it's audio adapters or drum keys or microfiber cloths for cleaning, you know, screens or glasses or whatever. I'm just kind of rattling stuff off the top of my head that I found. It really is about having a place for everything. So I've talked about this before, but in the United States, we have this store called the Container Store. The shoe boxes that you can buy there that are transparent make great storage containers for things that I've mentioned in the past. Audio adapters going in there. I have a box of Sony recorders, some GoPro stuff, various things that go in these boxes. I think that you'll find that that really will help you organize. Now, getting rid of stuff is that, yeah, that's different. That's going to be very different because you're going to come across stuff that you think you need to keep. And you might want to think about purging a lot of stuff. Let's take it, you know, in general categories. Uh, The number one thing that piles up for me is paper. So receipts, bills, you know, anything paper related, right? So first off, there's an app that you can get on your Android or Apple phones and your iPads and stuff like that. It's called Adobe Scan. 
And what it basically does is scan documents and it does a really great job of it. And then you can turn those documents into PDFs and it works great because you lay out the document. Let's say it's a, a receipt from whatever. You lay the document down on a contrasting background, like I've got a black music stand here that I put the receipts on. Then you just stand above it, hold steady, and it'll automatically scan it. You can change how it scans, you know, in terms of uh, the borders and such, you can crop it. And then you can title it and then save it as a PDF. That allows me to pretty much be a digital pack rat and save everything, all receipts. If you label them correctly, it'll be easy to find them later. And then you can shred the documents after the fact. Generally, anything that you think is of value that needs to be scanned, scan it and then get rid of the paper part of it. Shred, you know, uh, sensitive documents, things that maybe have your name and address that you don't want others to be, you know, going through your garbage and getting. Sometimes we throw away stuff that we're not thinking what's on those pieces of paper. And there could be small bits of information that, you know, over time, if somebody can add all that up, you know, could lead to identity theft or somebody doing something nefarious. So just be safe, buy a shredder, good shredder will go far. But then we get to stuff that's harder to, to make a decision about, like cables, you know, uh, various cables and power cords and stuff like that. There's definitely a box of cables you have that you haven't used for years that you could easily just take to Goodwill or you could take it to, you know, if you live here in the Bay Area, you could take it to Urban Ore, uh, any place that will reuse stuff, or resell it. So my recommendation on, you know, should I sell it? Should I give it away, et cetera? You know, set a dollar threshold for yourself, you know, and let's say anything under 25 bucks, you give away to friends or you give away to, you know, places like Goodwill. And, and if it's above that, maybe you sell it, you know, if it's got a certain value that you think is important enough and worth the time and effort to sell, sell it. So I think you get, get the gist of it where I'm going. I've talked about various parts of this over the years, but it's always good to revisit it, I think, uh, especially at the top of the year, like we're at now with this episode. Final thought too is buy yourself a label maker. I'll put a link in the show notes to a label maker that I use, that I find helps when I'm labeling those boxes from the container store and, and things like that. And just so that when you come across stuff and you see a box and you're like, what's in the box? Well, you can see what's in the in those clear shoe boxes, but having a label on it too quickly lets you know, oh, right, right, right. This is the box of mic stand adapters, whatever it is. And then when you come across things that might go in that box, you don't even think. You just grab it, you pop it in the box, it's out of the way and things are clear. That said, I hope your next year's clutter-free year really helps us think better helps us uh, navigate our space and, and determine what our workflow is going to be more effectively. So I wish you luck. That's my rant. Thanks for listening. I have grown so tired of sending audio over Dropbox, Google Drive, and the other convoluted methods out there. And I have found a few other solutions that could work, but the interfaces just were not to my liking. I was discussing this with former WCA guest Justin Perkins, whose advice I trust implicitly because Justin thinks all this stuff through. And he turned me on to what I think is the best way to send audio to clients, period. And I'm happy to say that I'm now a convert to Sampley Audio. Sampley allows for lossless playback of audio combined with time-coded comments. And if you're sending masters, it provides gapless playback. It's got a very sleek and intuitive design, and my clients love it. I can send them a mix or a master and they can get it even on their phones without a clumsy interface. They can immediately hear what I send them, make comments, and continue the process of refining what we're doing. So I reached out to the team at Sampley and I arranged for you all, the WCA listeners, to get a 20% discount when you sign up using the code WCA20, of course. So if you need a better solution for sending audio to clients, Head on over to sampleaudio.com. Don't forget to use the code WCA20 and drop the Dropbox. Stop with the Google Drive. Sampley Audio is the way to go, and I really think you're going to enjoy it. So check them out now, sampleaudio.com. Let's get to it. Wavy Wayne, here on the Working Class Audio Podcast. Wayne, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. It's great to have you on. I've been following you on Instagram and checking you out online, and you're doing such a great job with just 
laying out some educational things for people, some common sense things in the studio for people, because as a, as newer generations come up and the game is changing a bit, I think it's really important the information that you're presenting is taught to the younger generations so that they understand some of the basics, like your video on Instagram of no drinks, you know, <laughs> near the gear and stuff like that. So anyways, you're talking to us from where? I'm in my hometown of St. Louis, Missouri right now. I spent a good majority of my career living and working in New York City, but St. Louis is my hometown and uh, that's where I'm at right now. I really want to dig into a lot of different stuff here, but let's get some things established. So you were brought up there in, in St. Louis. Yeah. And what was your upbringing like with regards to music or recording? Where did that exposure come from? Well... It kind of started off with music from the time I was in second grade. I was into a Sunrise Conservatory program where we'd go into school early and I was playing the drums. So that was like my first introduction into read, reading music, learning how to play music and learning to play as a band. And from there, I just kind of, it kind of followed me and attached to me. And at some point, I turned into this kid rapper, right? So I go from making music in a band and in the marching bands and at about the sixth grade, I'm a kid rapper. This all stemmed from poetry, by the way, because I wrote some God Bless America poem in fourth grade and my teacher loved it. We ended up getting published for that poem. And then I brought it home to my friends on the block and they say, yo, Wayne, you got to turn this poetry into something else, man. Try rapping. And so I tried rapping. And so some of the older kids, they took me to a studio. And at that moment, when I was in the sixth grade, I walked into a studio, Red Light Studios. The engineer, Adam Long, was there. And he was just so enthusiastic and passionate about the recording and mixing process. And he was a guy that like me... I wouldn't imagine that he wanted to do anything with rap music or anything, but it was just his enthusiasm. He was on every top of every beat. He knew and understood the music and the language of it. And I I really got attached to that. And that moment really made me want to explore recording and mixing and studio life a whole lot more. That's interesting because I talked to a lot of engineers whose early experiences were in bands or in some situations where they had negative studio experiences and it made them want to get behind the board. But here you are getting faced with a positive experience that really got you excited. Absolutely. And that just goes to show like how your enthusiasm can be contagious about something too. So obviously like that's, those are kind of two catalysts and it, and it got to be something extreme a lot of times to push someone towards something. And in my case, it was a positive case to where I met someone who was just so enthusiastic is the only word I can think about it. He's so enthusiastic about what he was doing and passionate about that session and into the moment that I've never seen anyone work that way. And, and so I was like, yo, I got to I got to figure this thing out, too. Did you pursue the rap avenue or did you get derailed right then and there and, and start to head into the recording world? Well, I did keep going as a rapper a little bit, but I was always kind of stricken with stage fright. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of my, my, what you call, my kryptonite was uh, getting on a, a stage <laughs> and performing, man. I would, you know, have mom spaghetti on my sweatshirt already. <laughs> <laughs> but I would really have that, like that stage fright feeling. But I, I still had music in me, even from being in a marching band and everything. And I still did this all through high school. So I would still record and start recording my friends using even the little tiny white microphone that was connected to our computer at the time that was used for like voice chat and then calling on AOL Messenger and stuff <laughs> like that. But yeah. I figured out some way to record this microphone into acid or something. And so I was recording through high school and I kept doing that. And eventually it did get more sophisticated in recording. I had a friend who had a, a Pro Tools setup by the time I was like a senior in high school and had like the world's first inbox. <laughs> like literally, it was the first inbox ever, probably about 2006, 2007 time. And we would record microphone in the closet style and record like that. But my mother was kind of more serious about education. So she wanted to make sure that I would be going to college and pursuing a career, a real career. And and, you know, I, we know that rap 
it just didn't seem like it was a real career. So, but there were things that I knew I could do inside of music. So I leaned on production and recording at that time because I knew that those were like skills and, and real jobs. Like I could explore this and maybe work on a film set or work on radio or TV or anything like in audio. So I definitely kind of lean that way. I, I love the just the image of you on the PC recording into Acid. And audience, if you're young and you don't know what he's talking about, at the time, I guess, Sony at one point owned Acid. It yep. was a PC-based DAW, essentially. Yep, Sony Acid. And it came with all these loops and samples in it, and it had a step sequencer you could record in it. That was everything. It was, I think it was free or it came, it might even came attached to one of those AOL discs, like, we just to get computer programs in the mail, and, and that's, how, that's how it would happen. Your plans of wanting to stay in audio and, or stay involved in music in general, were they at odds with, with what your mom wanted? And did you come to a compromise ultimately? I wouldn't say that it was too much at odds, but it was more of like, my mom was like no nonsense. So once I graduated high school, I had like two options. I could either work or continue education. Like, you know, to go and and join the work for like just hanging out and pursuing a rap career wasn't an option. Like she wasn't rich or so she had no means to support a grown man. So I had to to make something of myself pretty quickly. So I did start working and I also attended school, a community college for a little bit. And while I was at community college, I was in a, a music tech class. That was pretty cool. But I had already got exposed to a lot of stuff in high school, but I was doing music tech class in college, but that also came with the algebra and the language arts and all this extra stuff, which happened at 7 a.m. And the music tech class was at 6 p.m. And so I was kind of at odds at, <laughs> dang, do I really want to wake up at 6 a.m. for algebra? <laughs> so I ended up going to, and doing really well in a music tech class stopped going to the rest of the classes, and my community college career ended after about the first semester. <laughs> yeah. Who wants to wake up that early for, for math anyway? For algebra, like a 7 a.m. algebra class, like, come on now. And, and this is St. Louis. It's cold and wintry. It's like, ah, oh, no, nah, I think the roads would be clear by 6. Like, they, it was literally my schedule was I had to, the music class was always at night at 6 p.m., and that had the 7 a.m. algebra for some reason, and I couldn't get it. So your community college career came to a uh, quick close. Yeah. So what did you do? Okay, so I just worked for a while, and honestly, I ended up getting myself into some trouble. We'll just call it some troubles. I, was, I started to do stuff that wouldn't lead me into a direction that I wanted to be in for my future. So, and it was just one night in particular that just, it got pretty bad and I, I escaped some things narrowly and, and luckily stayed out of harm's way. But the next morning I was, you know, at a crossroads and all through my high school career, it was, it was funny because through my whole high school career, I was in touch with Full Sail, Full Sail University, which I eventually ended up going to and, and graduating. But my whole high school career, I was in touch with them because I filled out a little form in the back of a Source magazine and mailed it in. Now, for the kids who are listening, if you don't know what Source magazine is, it used to be a physical magazine on paper. It come to your house, and then you would have to write stuff and put it in the mailbox, and then they would send you stuff. So it was like an ad, like, hey, are you interested in recording and mixing career? And I was probably in the 10th grade when I first filled this form out but they stayed in contact with me. And then, so after this horrible night, I get a call from a full sale rep. And it's like, hey, you still interested in coming down? We got some great options. We can walk you through your loan process, everything like that. And so I was like, you know what? I think this is my calling card for me to get out of St. Louis and go and pursue something more meaningful with my life. So that was a call that woke me up. And Within probably two weeks, I had sold everything that I had and packed up and moved to uh, Orlando. And I went to Full Sail to learn how to record and mix properly. <laughs> That's interesting. You and Leslie Brathwaite have that in common in that both of your mothers were very education focused and wanted that for each of you. And here you both wind up at Full Sail. 
Yeah, I mean, because I I tried the traditional college. Like I, coming up, I thought I would always go to like a four year university and pursue some type of degree, but that that kind of changed pretty quickly when I got to high school. I and and I was pursuing music more and more. I was like, I see that for what I really want to do, I, I don't need this idea of school. So finding full sale was it was a godsend. There was no other way. It was like, yo, that's exactly what I want, <laughs> and so uh, that was it was perfect. How was your experience there at Full Sail? It was up and down. It was up <laughs> and down. <laughs> Honestly, the main thing that I got out of Full Sail was what to learn, what to do, a lot of technique process. Yes. But I guess the 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 part that I say was down is just like it was just some fun time, man. It was a it was a time where <laughs> I got kicked out of Full Sail for three months, man. It's an exclusive for your podcast. <laughs> I got kicked out of, am I a troublemaker? I don't think so. Okay. But I got kicked out of Full Sail for three months. A friend of mine too, He who is also like a, uh, we should probably have him on here one day maybe. His name is uh, Darius. Uh, we were roommates and he's now like a multi-platinum producer. He worked with Kanye and a bunch of cats. He's in Atlanta. But basically he, he and I made a mixtape where we dissed like every kid in our, in our class at Full Sail. <laughs> So like we made this track dissing everybody and we printed off CDs and put it on every desk. And then when everybody went to break, they listened to it. And some of the stuff was pretty vulgar. Yeah, the, the school didn't like it. They amounted it to some type of harassment and suspended us for three months. <laughs> oh, man. I, I bet you made a lot of, lot of enemies in that class that day. Actually, I made one enemy, but I made a lot of friends. Okay. Most people thought it was great. We were there for entertainment and the battle rap culture was huge at that time. So like most people thought it was like, yo, this is exactly what we're here for. But it was just, you know, that one person who was just got their butt hurt that wanted to go and, and make it more than it was for real. But everybody else, like after that, like we were iconic, you know, like <laughs> we made the mixtape. We like, yeah, we back now. And we come back three months later, like it's the Hall of Fame. But it definitely was a stinger at that point because now I'm down in Orlando, Florida, away from home, and I have to find a way to provide for myself for the next three months. Like everything stopped. Everything was on hold, like no living expense checks, no nothing. So everything was on hold at that time. So I ended up being like a teacher's aide at a, for a second grade class for a little bit that was close to the, uh, the campus. Okay. So you, you, bridged, you bridged the gap there for the three months? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Made it happen. Made it happen. But Full Sail was great. They had this producer showcase. Darius and I came back to like be at the top of the class, honor students. Of course, top grades won every award and, and showcase that they had at the school. So it was just, I guess we just got a little bit too creative uh, for them at one point. <laughs> well, that's, that's hilarious. I've never heard of anybody getting kicked out of Full Sail, but. Oh, man. So you get out of Full Sail. What are your plans? What did you end up doing? Yeah, so right out of Full Sail, I went straight to New York, which is a move that I was planning for months before even graduating. Our program was 12 months. It was only a 12-month program. So we were mapping out. And when I say we, I, my, my friend Darius, who I spoke about before, we kind of like decided we were like in this together and we were, we were mapping it out. But I had visited New York a couple of times, already visited a few studios that I wanted to work at. Quad being one of the main ones that I applied for an internship and I was in contact with the studio manager there for about a few months before I left Full Sail. And um, yeah, so soon as I walked across the stage, literally the very next morning, I was on a flight to New York and started my internship the next day at Quad Studios. How did that experience work out? That worked out beautifully, actually, um, like being in that situation, just making myself available and being ready to help and being willing to work. It just opened up doors, gave me opportunities. The second day that I was actually at Quad, I got put into a session as a second assistant on a Jim Jones session. And Jim just happened to be coming to the studio for like the next year to work on an album like every day. Because one of the other assistants, he was like showing up late, couldn't catch the train, whatever. I'm here, not even supposed to be in a session yet, second day, but I'm in on this session and then it's a session that's going to take me and bring me in the room with a bunch of dope engineers, producers, artists over the next year of pretty much every day. And so I worked my way up through that room 
and over that time, from me starting off with the second assistant on the Jim Jones session, I eventually was the chief engineer at Jim Jones Studio that he built himself. Wow. Yeah. So that internship, and there was so much that happened in between then, but that just shows how like just from the people who I met that second day kind of really helped me to shape my whole career. So what was your big takeaway from Quad? What are the things that you can reflect on and say, oh, I learned this, this happened. What of that experience still resonates with you? For one, one of the main things is that we're working a service industry. Like what we mm-hmm. do is serve. So we have to make sure that we come with that five-star treatment to our clients, to our sessions, to all of our work. We have to bring that level of excellence. And so I always saw that in Quad to where every little detail was cared for and not just the musical aspects. Yes, that's a given, but everything that you might not think about that we don't want clients to think about when they walk through our door. So that aspect of it was huge. One thing that that I really learned was to not be afraid to let people see you work. As an intern, I wanted people to see me wiping the table or sweeping the floor, taking out the trash. Like Some people will feel like they have too much pride to do that, but I don't. And I think that was one thing like people would be like, yo, no matter what, I was never just sitting down. Like I'm working, I'm going to do something. I will find something to do. Make yourself useful. That's another huge, huge thing. Don't wait until someone needs to ask you for something. Identify a problem and start fixing it. (laughs) Like They got you here for a reason. Start applying, you know, what you're there for. So those are a couple of huge things. And obviously there's stuff inside of the recording and mixing. My man LB, (laughs) <laughs> was a dope engineer that he taught me so much just by working in his sessions and just being there watching the process, being the fly on the wall, you can soak up so much information that's invaluable. Plus you're in New York. I mean, I mean, yeah. That's a vastly different space than than Orlando. Oh yeah, and vastly different from St. Louis where I'm from, right? Mm. So I'm straight from small town Midwest to the biggest city in the world. But I always, I felt like I belonged there. I can't lie. I felt like I was at home. (laughs) How long did you stay in New York? I spent about nine years in New York. Hmm. So I'm working through studios. I met my wife in New York as well, right? Hmm. Uh, She's a singer and songwriter, Lydia Caesar. She's from New York. But everything was kind of changing. And I'm in New York right as things were transitioning from like the large studios. A lot of the studios were downsizing, selling off, closing, losing their big format consoles and and getting these little small production rooms. And this is what was happening. And a lot of people were making home studios even more and more. And it was like exploding. So while I was in New York, I started to do an instructional program. One of them, I started an after-school program called Hip Hop Jobs. And this is where I went to a high school And I would present different people from the industry to them, from record label executives to managers, photographers, audio engineers, producers, everybody besides the rapper, right? That was the the idea was to introduce all of these different jobs that go around being a rapper that the rapper couldn't do without to be successful on a large platform. And that was successful. And then I also used to get together in the weekends inside of a studio and do a course on home recording and recording yourself for people. And it was just like by flyers, you know, that I would post and hand out. And I would get people to come into the studio. And and, and that's how I was filling studio time and paying mm. for the studio time when there weren't sessions. I would be doing courses inside the room, doing classes like lessons. That's interesting, especially seeing how you're operating now as far as education you know, this inclination to do courses and and teach people about what it is they need to know, where do you think that comes from? A huge part of it comes from me fighting the man. (laughs) (laughs) If I must be honest, man. Yeah. My full sale debts were crazy. Mm. And it took me a long, long time to, to recover from that. And I feel like people shouldn't have to go through that. Yeah to get what you want. But I also feel at the same time, yes, me being able to go to full sale helped me to get out of a situation that wasn't progressive and it it did take me somewhere else. But is there a better way to do it without putting people in debt? Because that debt also could cause strain on my family later. Mm -hmm. When I'm done with that, that yes, it, it did help this situation, but it caused other situations, right? So is there a better way? And yes, there is a better way. 
education don't have to cost a fortune. It, it shouldn't have to cost a fortune. So that's what I want to provide for people is a chance to learn for almost free or for at least a fraction of what you will get from a university or you have an option, right? Just I just provide more options and, I, and I'm thankful for YouTube and the internet and stuff like that, that give us these options, right? We yeah. have YouTube University is the best. Even if you get the premium account, you still come out better. <laughs> wow. That's interesting. And it's, I don't want to slam the recording schools, but it does raise the question of whether or not we as audio professionals need to go that route. You know, I, ne I never went that route. And uh, I know many people who, who didn't go that route. But at the same time, I do know a lot of people who have gone that route, who have been crazy successful. Yeah. So I guess it just, it's not a one size fits all thing. But I think the it's key not. thing that you're saying that resonates with me is the debt is not to be going into debt like that because of the, as you say, and I've, I've experienced it myself, debt can cause strain in your family in your, yes. in your relationships. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And that was big for me. You know, that, that my mother and my grandmother were the co-signers on my loans, you know? Mm -hmm. And so while I'm out here chasing my dreams, like they're working blue collar job to pay back student loans. And so it was definitely stressful. So that's a huge reason why I, I want to help people to reach their dreams and, and make money for their families without going into huge amounts of debt. But like you said, though, it, it's about providing options because if you feel like that's the best option for you to be successful, for me at that time, that was the best option for me. There wasn't too much more that I could do. To me, I, I didn't know <laughs> I didn't know nothing else, no other way to, to make it. In, I had to get out of my, my hometown and go to a larger market, at least where the music industry lives, and get exposure to these types of things. So I, I needed that. We live in a different time now, though. Yeah. Hey, WCA listeners, if you have a question you want me to answer, you can head over to podinbox.com slash WCA. That's P-O-D-I-N-B-O-X dot com slash WCA. You can leave a comment or ask a question, and I will answer it on the show. That's podinbox.com slash WCA. Just kind of looking back at your time in New York, for example, survival for nine years. I mean, New York is not cheap. So how did you make it work? So. When I first got to New York, I had about 2000 bucks, and I had a place that was going to cost me 1500 bucks to live for three months. So that was my first plan. I had that three months secured, right? And I knew I could live for three months. I had a little bit of money to left over for food over the next three months, and I could figure it out from there. As long as I can have somewhere to go to sleep for three months, like I can find a job, I can make some money. Like I know that I'm good, I, I can work my way up in three months. Like I had that belief in me, like, okay, within three months I'm gonna be making money. And, and I was, I was working job, one of my first jobs in New York while I was interning. So I was interning eight, 10 hours a day, but I was also working a job. And this job I was working, basically I was, I call it selling babies. <laughs> I was standing on the street in New York City Stopping people, asking them to sponsor kids that are like hungry and, you know, about nurse, the world peace type of thing. You know, I don't want to put out the exact company, but I was like, hey, excuse me, you have a minute to talk about sponsoring a child for 20 cents a day and it'll help them to get clean food and water, you know. Um, and, and so I would do that on the streets of New York. And that taught me so much because I would have to literally talk to 10,000 people a day. And get 9,950 no's. Yeah. <laughs> but then those 50 yeses, though, was all I was there for. And that, that just teach you resilience, how to detach yourself, your emotions from the process, how to stay fixed on your goal, and how to not take things personally. Because here I am interjecting somebody's day. If they tell me to fuck off or whatever, yeah, it's not about me. That's whatever's going on with them. So learning all of those type of things, how to deal with people, talk to people, how to stay focused on your goal, that one job of selling babies really uh, helped me with that. Yeah. I mean, and on the streets of New York, I mean, come yes. on, what better training ground? I feel like everybody needs to do that. Go find a nonprofit and go to New York for a, a month and work on the streets every day to get people to sign up for your cause. Wow. <laughs> so you did you did various jobs like that throughout yep. your time there? Yep. So various jobs like that. But it wasn't long before I was starting to make money in the industry. Probably a few months in, I started to actually work with uh, DJ Kid Capri. 
He had a home studio. This was a connection from actually the studio receptionist that was working at Quad. She also had aspirations to be a manager. So she was interning at an artist management firm while she was working at the front desk at Quad. And she ended up connecting me with Kid Capri, who was an artist they were managing, you know, DJ Kid Capri. And he just needed an engineer to come by his house and record his beats. He was making beats. He was producing. And so he would make his beats in the MPC and and I would go over his house every night and we would uh, make beats and record them from the MPC into Pro Tools and, and mix the beats so he can shop them in. That lasted for a while, but that was like my first big industry gig. I was like catching the bus over to New Jersey to go to Kid Capri's basement and record his beats. <laughs> How did you navigate figuring out, okay, well, I'm going over to this guy's house and I'm going to do this gig. How did you figure out, okay, I, I need to charge this much and I need to approach him to get the money in this way? Like, how did, how did you figure that out? Man, I didn't. They told me, hey, this is how much the job pays. Here's where you need to be if you want it. And so I was like, okay, that works. And uh, I did it. And to be honest, it, I mean, it wasn't a lot of money, but it was enough to do what I was there to do and make money and stay there, you know? And that's what I did. Put it out. I think I was making about $100 a day doing that job. And it was probably about six hours through the night. A lot easier than standing on the streets of New York, huh? Oh, uh, uh, hell yeah. It was, <laughs> I mean, this was a party. This is a party. Compared. I'm like literally living the dream. I'm like, and you're paying me and I can pay my rent and eat. So like, I'm good. To me, that was... What was important was to build up a resume, build up relationships, build up a, a catalog of work. At that point in my life, I didn't have kids or family. I didn't really care about where I slept or anything like that. Like, I just wanted to work. I wanted to be around people. I wanted to be around the music. So like a lot of nights I didn't leave. I would just sleep in this basement and just wake up and we just keep working. And it wasn't about the money. It was more about I'm this kid here from St. Louis in New York, like working with legends, right? I'm in this legends basement right now. Like, you know, like <laughs> I'm going to be all right. Yeah. You're thinking bigger picture at this point. Yeah, exactly. And it's always been the bigger picture. I'm still thinking bigger picture. It's always more. So eventually you left New York and you came back to St. Louis. Yes. There was a school here in St. Louis that was teaching production and recording. It was a production recording college, Extreme Institute. Shout out to all my students there. But I linked up with the dean at the school called Napa, who is a pretty big engineer as well. So we, we talked and I ended up coming down to St. Louis to teach a course because I'm in St. Louis. I mean, in New York, working with Jim Jones for the most part, this is probably like five years into our working relationship, but he eventually ended up selling his studio. He built a, a nice studio right in Midtown, like right down the street from the Empire State Building. But that ended up fading away and we were doing other spots. And so the work was a little more sparse for a freelance engineer now. So I was reaching out for opportunities. And when this came across my radar, I was like, yo, this would be a great opportunity. And initially it was just going to be temporary for me to come and teach a class or two for like a month. But it ended up being a, a little longer, <laughs> a lot longer. Yeah. And it turned into about four or five years or something teaching at this school. And then eventually I became the program director for the college. But I really wanted to be a part of that opportunity to teach students from my hometown. I just thought that that was amazing to be able to come back and kind of share what I learned now that there was a full sale in my city. Yeah. There was that. So to be a part of it from the teaching aspect, I thought that that was just a good opportunity for me. That's fascinating. Because, I mean... That's a full circle thing. Thinking back on what you've called the one bad night, thinking back on that moment and then this making a decision not to stay going down that path, Orlando, New York, and then right back to St. Louis to start doing this teaching. I think that's pretty amazing. Yeah. You know, everything just happens for a reason, for sure. You just got to make sure you stay pushing it and keep pushing forward. That's what, I, what I've what i always learned is that no matter you know what happens to you, find a way through it to make it you know worth something. Uh, don't let bad things happen to you for no reason. Make them pay. <laughs> your studio that you have now that I see in, in all your, your Instagram videos and on your YouTube channel, is that in a separate building from where you live? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. 
Yeah. So I have a, a commercial studio that I built. After I realized I was going to be back here in St. Louis for a while, I taught a couple of phases. Like, all right, you know what? Let's build a studio. So we found a place and built a studio and it's transformed a little bit, but it's still in that same location. It's been there for about six years now. And now most recently, I'm coming to you right now. I have a podcast studio. That's where I'm at now. This is a, a different location. I'm not too far from the recording studio. So you're teaching, you're running your studio as well. And man, you're killing it in the world of social media. I mean, as far as YouTube and Instagram, you're taking what you know and really using the tools we have of the day to make the best of it. And what I'm curious about, especially looking at as many followers as you have, what do you think would be your advice to others in regards to using social media in the way that you do? What are you trying to achieve and how should others look at it? Oh man. So if I have to give some social media advice, it would be to know that there is no one method for all of social media. Every platform uh, is a little bit different. YouTube is different than Instagram is different than TikTok. And they want to see different content on those platforms. And one of the biggest things, though, is consistency, because you you need to really find out what people want to see and what works. So in order to do that and to analyze that, you have to put some stuff out. You can't just put one thing out and stop and, and oh, that didn't work. No, you got to put 100 pieces of content out, see which ones they gravitated to. Take those top 10 and reproduce those in some type of way and see, all right, now we're down to a top five. And so you got to be strategic about it. People say strategy all the time, but then don't really come to the table with the strategy. But I think having a strategy is really important. So, so, and you do that by being consistent, putting stuff out, analyzing it and reading the data and then reacting towards your data. Hmm. Do you find that you're getting work as a result of your activities on social media? Absolutely, absolutely. It is a huge marketing tool. It's the biggest marketing tool that you could do right now with YouTube. I literally make videos teaching people how to record and mix themselves. Do you think that hurt my recording and mixing business? Or does it make it bigger? I It makes it so much more like, yo, I'm the guy to go to. What it does is solidifies my reputation and solidifies my brand and it gives me authority in the field mm -hmm. because I can present it in a way that people know that I know what I'm talking about. And so that definitely helps the, it helps the business so much. So I'm definitely not a, a person who wants to hold on to information. I will teach you and show you whatever it is that I know to and show it to you because everybody's going to do it a little bit differently. And for those audio professionals that may say, ah, oh, man, I don't, I don't do Instagram. I don't, I don't do that stuff. What would you say to them? If it works for you, that's great. I mean, some people that works for them and they can do really well. Like there are some really high level audio professionals that have mega plaques and, you know, they're working with the biggest stars of, of all time, but they don't have the following on social media. So it, it don't have to be for everybody. Warren Buffett, does he have an Instagram? No, nope. <laughs> I, I don't know if he has an Instagram, but if if he does, like there's plenty of uh, finance guys out there with the Instagram and it's doing great for them. But Warren Buffett don't have no Instagram, you know, yeah. and he don't need an Instagram. So it all depends on what you think people will gravitate towards for you because you have to be comfortable in it. It has to be something that you enjoy doing because you got to do it a lot. It's going to have to be part of your lifestyle if you decide to do it and you don't want to decide to do something that you hate. So. If you are successful already without it, then don't worry about it. Yeah. But I think there's definitely room for growth no matter what if you jump on and get, get hot. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting to me that you talked about having stage fright early on. Mm. Was it hard for you in the beginning to start doing videos? Okay. So I kind of broke out my shell when I do that because I, when I, once I start teaching, that's kind of being on stage too. Like I'm literally teaching in front of 40 students in a class, college students. So some of them are older than me. You know, we got teenagers in there. So it's like a, a wide array of students here. And I'm and so by me teaching them face to face, that started to help to give me a whole lot of confidence 
on how I would be as an instructor, like how to how to teach and, and interact with people because my teaching style is different than another teacher that you might get, which is what brings my value is that I'm going to deliver it in a, in a particular way, right? Now, when I got to making videos, honestly, making videos is easy because it's most of the time just me and a camera and there's nobody else there. So that's an easy way to practice getting out of your shell because I can sit here and talk to myself then I can edit it. So that kind of came a little bit more. And also just being around people, being around the industry, watching some of the greats do it from the backgrounds that I got to be around. I kind of picked up on a lot of game throughout my years. Mm. Um, but I, I still, if you go back and watch some of my older videos, still had to find myself. Absolutely. Oh, if you go back <laughs> to early, early episodes of this podcast, I'm like, oh my God, I sound like a kid. Yeah. I looked like a kid too. I was all, I was, I was a little smaller and stuff. And hi guys, we're going <laughs> to record today. Because yeah. <laughs> you start off doing stuff, you kind of imitate first before you become original. Like, oh, I like this thing. And I used to love Dave Pensado. So my video, to me, I was like doing in the layer part two when I was first yeah. started uh, doing videos. <laughs> I used to, I love Dave Pensado. So I think I might've been imitating him a little strong in the beginning. That's what we do when we start. Yeah. Well, I can't let this interview end without asking you, where did the name Wavy Wayne come from? <laughs> so Wavy Wayne that actually came from a client of mine. His name is Tino. He's working in the studio a few years ago. And I was mixing on a track of him. And, you know, the energy was high. Everybody was excited. And he was like, yo, that's Wavy. And, yo, you Wavy Wayne. He's also used to call me Sensei. He was just like the king of nicknames and, and stuff. So he called me Wavy Wayne. And one day it, it kind of clicked. I was like, yo, that makes perfect sense for everything that I do. That's excellent. I love <laughs> the name. Thank you. Where can people find out more about you? You can go to wavywayne.com. That's one place, Wavy Wayne, W-A-V-Y, Wayne.com. That'll be one place or Wayne.wave. That's a dot W-A-V, like the audio file. Like, I'm sure you guys know. Yeah, <laughs> or that's on all social media. So any social media, Wayne.wave. Otherwise, WavyWayne.com. And as usual, audience, I'll put a link in the show notes to all the ways that you can check out Wayne and everything that he's doing. Hey, man, it was really great to chat with you. I'm so glad that you responded so quickly and we could put this together, especially during the holidays with the chaos that can happen at that time. But really appreciate your time and appreciate your uh, perspective here. Yo, thank you, Matt. I appreciate being here. Yeah. All right. Well, you take care. Peace. We all love gear, no doubt about it. But on occasion, you might have a question that pertains to something that is not gear related at all, but more career, health, or life related and that's why working class audio is very proud to sponsor the gearspace.com sub forum known as audio life simply enough this is a place where you can bring all your questions about career life hacks travel hobbies etc everything non-gear related that you might have a question about that's best suited to ask your fellow audio peers so check it out audio life located at gearspace.com Wavy Wayne here on the Working Class Audio Podcast. Thanks so much for being here with me today. If you have a guest suggestion, head on over to workingclassaudio.com, find the guest suggestion form, fill it out, send it over, and remember that that suggestion helps fuel this show. Guests are the centerpiece of this show. So without them, we wouldn't really have a show. We just have a bunch of uh, ramblings for me, and that only goes so far. So if you could do that, I'd really appreciate it. That's all for me today. I want to thank the crew. That includes Anne-Marie Plo on the editing, Cliff Truesdale on the Working Class Audio theme song, and Mr. Chuck Smith there at the top of the show with that magical voice. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Reach out anytime. And until next time, my friends, take care. <laughs>